everyone. Good morning. Good to see you at Camp Lake Baptist this morning. Good to have the kids up front today. Usually they're in junior church uh, with the choir singing today, so they're going to join us for a little while today. Uh, not, not singing in the choir, but you get to enjoy the first half of the service, all right? So glad all of you are here today, and today is a special uh, day, a special month we are having, actually, but the first uh, special Sunday of that month in which today is Friend Day, and people were encouraged to invite someone to come to church today. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but we're so glad you're here today. Let's take our hymnals and start out our service by singing praise to God, number 255, in that hymnal in front of you in the pew. Praise Him, praise Him. Let's take it out and let's all stand and lift our voices to our Lord this morning. 255. Praise Him. Amen. Yeah. 
Thank you, Lord, for these who've come out in your house, Lord. I pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray, Father, that your word will be open to our hearts, that we would hear it and understand it, and that if anybody needs to be saved, Lord, may they be saved today. Thank you, Lord, for these children that can come in today and be able to watch our choir sing and hear them. We thank you for the ministry that we have to children in this church. Bless each one of them as well. Bless our day today, Father. And this word to our hearts. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You could be seated. Wow. I, I see a few people have responded to Friend Day and have invited some friends. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. That's great. And we're going to recognize you in a few moments if you'll, if you'll let me. In fact, I heard one of you kids had a Friend Day. Brought a friend. Who brought a friend today? Awesome. You two brought him. Awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, Mary, you need to make sure they get something. They'll get something different. Okay, yeah. they'll get something different? All right. But the, for the adults, we have something for you in a few minutes. Yeah. We'll, we'll look at that and share that with you. I'm excited. That's going to be great. It's good to see each one of you here. We're especially uh, praying for Lorene and uh, Christy and Becky. We're praying for you ladies uh, in Steve's homegoing. Uh, pray, they shared with me a little bit about being able to go and and be with him uh, Friday, Thursday or Friday, I forget which day you were saying, and that was a blessing because they were they were actually told that he was gone and he wasn't quite ready to depart yet. Praise God and uh, uh, praise the Lord, he is in glory. Isn't that wonderful to know? Amen. So let's keep praying for that family. Is uh, By the way, in the bulletin, that what's been changed, and this it was right what was put in the bulletin, but it's been changed since then. Uh, Tuesday afternoon, it's from 5 to 8, is, and that's correct, right? 5 to 8 is the family visitation time over at Throop uh, Funeral Home in um, Coopersville, so just know that. But the service is Wednesday morning at 11. Be praying for um, their brother and Lorene's son, Tim. He's going to be preaching the funeral, and uh, so we, we really want to pray for him. He just went through surgery. But God will give him the words to say. Pray for him as we do. All right, it's good to have you here. I'm excited to be with you this morning. Pastor Mark. All right, you can take your hymnals now and turn to number seven. Those of you who are looking at your bulletin, it says Lee Elby has a special today. but um, She's ready and willing. But, uh, her special today requires a sound man. And uh, both of our sound men are gone today, so... We'll get you in on the schedule real soon again, Lee, all right? But that couldn't happen today. So that's why we're skipping over that if you're looking at your bulletin. But let's go to number seven and sing, Blessed Be the Name. Amen. 
you're singing this morning, church. Really enjoying it. Amen. Ash is going to come to the announcements now. All right. Mary wants you to stand right now. Mary has in her hands some gift cards that are going to be handed out to some people that, first of all, the visitors that are here today, you don't have to be a first-time visitor, but if you're a first-time visitor, that's great. And I see, um, I see Sam and Shelly Hayscamp, friends of um, Brother Dave. Thank you for inviting them, Dave. And you guys get a, an award. Hang on a minute, Mary. There's also somebody else here. Dave, did you, did you look around and see who else came this morning? No. Look over your right, your left shoulder and look back. You've been working on somebody. There's John. John Myers is here. Good to have you, John. John's a resident of Camp Lake. Talked to him on a couple occasions. So we're glad you're here today. John, go ahead and, and pass those out, if you will, Mary. You can. I, I've never been able to stop you in the past. Go right ahead. I really want you guys to get really excited about this. Okay, next week is family week. Um, so, you know, it's Easter. If you got any family that don't go to church anywhere, or maybe they haven't gone in a long time, you know, call them up and say, would you come to our church on family day? We'd love to have you. You'll get a gift. And um, honestly, I mean, I would just love to see this whole auditorium full I would every do. week. Yeah. Every week. But if we gotta, we gotta get to work. It, it's not just up to Pastor and I and the deacons. It's up to you guys. We need your help. Okay. So get out there. You know, if you if you miss Friend Day, if you bring a friend next week, I promise you, I will give them one of these. Okay. I mean, just keep just keep working at it and get excited about it. Tell everybody about it. And and uh, I just want you to know they get a gift. They get a choice of a big big gift card, a Hobby Lobby, or a Chick Fil A. What would you like? What would you like? Oh, Chick-fil-A. Oh, yeah. There you go. You're welcome. Any of those sound good to you? Oh, yeah. Chick-fil-A and Big Coffee. Oh, all right. Hey, Mary. Don't they both get one? I gave them both one. Okay, I didn't know. I couldn't say. How about Dave? Oh, Dave. Dave gets something, Dave, doesn't it? What would you like? You're right. I'm sorry. What would you like? Big Key Coffee, Hobby Lobby. These are all co Christian companies that have taken a stand for the Lord. And Amen. We want to support them. And each one is designated for ten dollars, by the way. So what would you like? Uh, all right. Thank you. And Mary, one more thing. Would you go find a packet to give to John? He's a first-time visitor. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next week is Family Day. Let's keep that in mind. Amen. And, uh, yes. I said amen. Oh, amen. <laughs> Go for it. Wonderful. Yes, sweetheart. Well, what day is it? Wednesday or Sunday? Next Sunday that we're having this, uh, which is Easter Sunday, we're calling it Family Day. Now, there's still stuff going on here Wednesday, so don't forget that. In fact, I think you guys have something special. Is it, a, is it they're going to watch a Christian movie or something? Or I don't know, but don't forget about Wednesday. That's awesome. Actually, Mary can speak to that. Um, a question came up about Wednesday, Mary. Is there something special Wednesday? For the kids? Yes. Yes, there is movie night. Popcorn movie. Oh, there it is. Popcorn night. About Easter. All right, the great. True, the true meaning of Easter. Amen. Well, I don't need to say any more. you got the bulletin in front of you. You can read it yourself. But I uh, just want to put out another thank you, as I said this morning, to... Uh, Bob and Yvonne for the wonderful luncheon yesterday. That was really delicious. The food was great. You know, I wish we could fill this church up like we can for funerals. Yeah. Yesterday was so full that we didn't have room in the old auditorium. All the more reason that we need to build. We have a plan. Uh, we have the, the plans laid out. We want to build a Fellowship Hall slash gym over this way, a larger vestibule, a new kitchen, uh, um, a bigger uh, barrier-free bathroom. It, we were not going to eliminate our present bathrooms, but we need to add that one more. Um, and so we want to have a groundbreaking soon. We just have to get things going with the township to get the building permit and to get all that going. Um, there will be some work happening out here soon, and that's our new septic system. Uh, we were able to completely avoid this 
terrible debacle of having to join the sewer system, which would have cost us over $100,000. Praise God. That all been answered. So be praying for this stuff. Amen? All right. Appreciate it. Last word? Offering? Yeah, we need to take the offering. What, what, that's what you guys are back there for. <laughs> what? I guess i got to turn in my preacher card if I forget an offering. I mean, if a preacher forgets an offering, he's going to get fired, right? But... Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. Father, thank you for the wonderful faithfulness and giving of our people here. Lord, thank you for what you did for us most of all, Lord. And uh, um, what we do for you is just our reasonable service. May we make that a true uh, sacrifice of ourselves of, to make that reasonable service. And money is just one, one aspect of it. Please bless this offering in Jesus' name.
thousand angels. Uh, very good. All right, let's turn to 126 just to get that song ready, but it's time for us to greet one another. We like to have a greeting time here at Camp Lake Baptist, and this is the time. We'll sing 126 after the greeting. You might want to turn there and get it ready, but let's all stand and greet those around you and make everyone feel welcome here at Camp Lake Baptist this morning. Jesus made his entry into Jerusalem. 
people call it the triumphal entry in Jerusalem, but when you think of that phrase, you think of something different than what actually happened, right? Um, he could have come with an entourage of angels, 10,000 angels, and made a grand entrance into Jerusalem, but he didn't do that. Um, he didn't even come on a, on a horse. He could have come on a white horse with all his disciples on horses behind him and made a, a triumphal entry in that way because the horse, of course, is a sign of royalty, but he didn't do that. The disciples walked, and he rode on a donkey mm -hmm. into Jerusalem because the first time he came, he didn't come to be the reigning king over Jerusalem. He came to be our savior. Mm -hmm. Our yeah. savior. And we'd like to just sing that old that old hymn. And you can look at the words if you want to. Page 22. It's how great thou art. But as we, when we sing this, there's a couple of souls. But when Miriam sings verse 3, and when I think, I'd like you to really stop and just think, you know, of what God did for us on, uh, on that day when he came into Jerusalem. Came in ready. Ready to die for us because mm -hmm. he loved us so much. How mm -hmm. great thou art.
Wow. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you, choir. Thank you, children. You were very good. I appreciate that very much. We don't get to have them in here very often, and they were very good as they were here. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to the Gospel of Luke, if you will. Luke 23, 23rd chapter. You know what makes me uncomfortable? It's when a preacher is silent. <laughs> like, like there's a, a pause. If I'm sitting in the audience, I, I get uncomfortable. I get nervous for him. And I don't do that very often, but I was thinking about that. And, uh, I was sharing with our adults who attend our Bible study on Tuesday nights as we were wrapping up the book of Jeremiah and we went into the book of of lamentation. I was sharing them about a tradition that that states that Jeremiah had a prominent view of the old city at that time because he was in a cave that was part of Golgotha because they claimed that that's Jeremiah's grotto. And I thought, I wonder if that's accurate or not. So I kind of did a little investigating and, and come to find out through topographical maps that that prominence of Golgotha is high enough and up above the old city. And um, so I, I think it'd be interesting. It's probably very likely that uh, Jeremiah sat in that place weeping over Jerusalem after it was wiped out and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And as he started saying right there in Lamentations, uh, how is the city that sitteth empty? empty? And it, he wept over uh, Jerusalem and wept over all of that desolation of that place. And when you think about that, fast forward about 600 years, and you've got a city on this day that we're going to talk about, the day that is probably the most important day in history, when you consider it, at least these several days, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord. That, that population of the city might have swelled to nearly a million people for the Passover. Jews came from all over the world for Passover. And they came uh, from all over the country. And so the place was swarming with people. And there, prominently on that hill, were three crosses. We're going to talk about the three crosses of Calvary this morning. Father, please speak to our hearts and help us. Lord, all that you went through, and yet you knew what was going to happen, and you still went through with it, Lord, is astounding. It's amazing. You knew what was going to happen to you. You prayed in your humanity. You prayed, let this cup pass from me, but you also prayed, not my will, but thine be done. Thank you for that, Lord, that you went. You became obedient, as Paul said, unto death, even the death of the cross. Thank you. Speak to us through this passage today. Have your way in our place. We know you're here amongst us. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start reading about verse 26. And what I'm going to do is read the whole chapter that I'm going to read. I'm actually going to uh, uh, read down probably to about uh, 48, 49, somewhere in there. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. With then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. By the way, this hasn't happened yet. It's still future. 
For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? There are also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be, the, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same con condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. I was thinking about the three crosses of Calvary. Now, the only time you'll see the word Calvary in your Bible is right here in the verse that we read. And it's, uh, I forget what verse it was, verse 33. That's the only time you'll see it in the Bible. Um, the place is also called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And so um, it was a prominent hill viewed from all of the old city. Everybody could see that. Just imagine, I don't know how often the Romans were killing people on crosses. It was, a, it was a gruesome way to die. I don't know how often these things happened uh, where they had somebody hanging on a cross. But on this particular day, three people are hanging on these crosses. A gruesome sight indeed. I don't know uh, about you, but there was a certain part of our old nature that likes to see things like this. You know... Uh, let's have a hanging. You know, there are people that would lynch people and, and, and watch what would happen when somebody's hanged by the neck and uh, their body would maybe tremble and writhe and pain before they give up their ghost. Um, there's just a certain part of us that wants to see it. And then there's a certain part of us that dreads to see something like that. Uh, you know, we, we're morbid, aren't we not, in our old nature? Just imagine these people. The Bible tells us in, in the book of... Um, uh, Isaiah in 53, it, it, it talks about he was numbered with the transgressors. So the people walking by would see three crosses and think there's three criminals there. Three crosses. There's three deserving people that got what they deserve. And sometimes uh, we, we don't realize how so many people in the world look at that, don't think a thing of it. And yet the Bible tells us the one in the middle because he says these malefactors were on the right hand and on the left, that the one in the middle was sinless. Don't ever forget that. He is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, higher than the heavens. But I wanted to take each one of these crosses and, and think about them and look at them because there's a lot in this passage that uh, could give us a little insight. Um, you know, it's interesting when you read and look at the words in red, you see some of the seven sayings of Christ from the cross. Three of them are mentioned in this passage. And we're going to look at one of those in a few minutes. Um, a lot is happening. Just this very thought in verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. In a few short words, in black and white, 
Something that I can't even describe with my own description happened. A very gruesome way to die. Nailing his hands and his feet to the cross. Uh, the Bible talks about a crown of thorns. It talks about a scourging where his back was ripped, ripped wide open. It talks about him shedding his blood. We'll talk about all those things eventually. But I just want to think about these three crosses and who they held. The first one is called the cross of rejection. Go down there about verse 39. Let's look at 39. This is where the key focus is going to be. 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. You know, I'm amazed at the things that people say to each other. You know, have you ever been in the midst of a um, road rage incident? Have somebody go on a tirade of, of filthy language toward you and you, you, didn't, you didn't know what you did? Or hopefully you were not the instigator of the road rage or the problem person in the road rage. I'll never forget Pastor Neville, who I was my first ministry as a youth pastor. He shared with us that uh, he was at a red light. He saw this lady that had a bumper sticker that said, honk if you love Jesus. So he honked. And the lady jumped out of her car and cussed him out. <laughs> he said, I was just honking because I love Jesus. And she sheepishly got back in her car and took off. You know, be careful what you advertise on your bumper. But a lot of people get upset at the least little thing. And Christians are like that too sometimes. But I'm amazed at the way people rail on each other. And we have a, we're in a very uncivil society right now. Ever yeah. since yeah. ever since COVID, it's gotten worse and worse. Have you, have you seen some of these people fighting over masks or not masks? Or have you seen, I, I remember getting some coffee in Sparta. I went in on a, early on a Sunday morning and, and, and I just got out of the way because this woman was so mad that I was occupying her space. Well, I had bought my Starbucks, I'm ashamed, because I like Big B better than Starbucks. But anyway, I got Starbucks one Sunday morning before I came to church. And I needed something else. It was early. The place was open. Um, this was right during COVID, right around the time they quit being open 24 hours. You remember that? Uh, and so uh, this woman got all mad because I was occupying her space. Well, I was there first. And she said, Be, get back. Get away from me. You know? And I said, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I backed up. Well, I didn't want a confrontation with this woman. She was angry, she was mad, she was ugly. All the things that were against her. I didn't want to get in with this lady. Okay, I'm back. And you know, I wanted to say, well, have a good day. I hope, hope you, good morning to you too. You know, you want to be sarcastic sometimes. People rail on each other now. And they have hatred toward each other. Not that that never existed, it always has, but imagine this man who has just been nailed to... His cross, just like Jesus has, and just like the other one, he's angry. Uh, he's had it, but he's, and notice what he says. He says, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. If thou be Christ. A statement of doubt. Do you understand now that's worded? If thou be Christ. It's a statement of doubt. This is a cross of rejection. This is a man who didn't believe. This is a man who, as the scripture says, without hope, without God in the world. And that's, the, that's the, the group in the world who have rejected Christ as their personal Savior. I remember this accident for some reason because of this very idea of no hope. There was a couple of teenagers, they were driving north on Algoma back in the 90s. And I read about it. And um, I had just been by that corner. I had gone up to Harold and Helen's house. And I think we had gone fishing or something. And I had just gone by that corner the day before, or that day, but it hadn't happened yet. But it was Algoma and 19 Mile. These two kids driving, speeding, they, they passed somebody and lost control. And their car went into that ditch. And they burst into flames. And the people around heard them screaming for help. And nobody could do anything. They lost their lives. They were screaming for help. There is a fire barn on 19 Mile, less than 100 yards from that spot, and nobody could save them. They were without hope. No help. I say that to say 
That's the case of everybody that rejects Christ. Yeah. There is no hope. There's no help apart from Christ. If you're saved today, be thankful. Amen. You've received the help. If you're not, be warned. Don't keep going through life because you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know when the end is coming. But this man railed on him. It doesn't sound like it was pleasant. It doesn't sound like he was a believer. It doesn't sound like he had a positive look on Christ. If thou be the Christ. Save thyself and us. He probably had heard about Jesus' miracles and heard about uh, what he claimed, but he kept living his lifestyle, being a thief and a robber and uh, accosting people, and he got caught, and they didn't play around. It's not like our justice system nowadays, which is like a revolving door. People go to prison, they get right out, and they go and commit more crimes, and it's a shame, isn't it? The Romans didn't do that. You say they were hanging on a cross because of being Robbers? Yeah. I mean, you could think of worse things. You could think of worse things in relation to crimes, but they were being on a cross because they were robbers. Think about that. They were thieves. This thief represents everyone who dies without Christ. Keep that in mind. That's the cross of rejection. Number two, on the other side of Jesus is the cross of repentance. Now, just imagine how... These crosses are juxtaposed, how they are positioned. Jesus is in the middle and either side of him, and they are close enough to see each other, to hear each other's words. Think about that. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Thou dost not, dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man had done nothing amiss. Then he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I want you to think about this cross of repentance as the man, the first one is a, a man who died in his sins, and this man. He gets to die to sin. Every believer dies to sin because sin will no longer have dominion over us in the eternal and nature of it. We have a sin nature. We have a, a body that has to be changed. But praise God, we have been able to die to sin because of Christ. The first died in sin. This one died to sin. I want you to think about three things. First of all, notice his penitence. Penitence is uh, the idea of an admission of guilt, an admission that he had, he's deserving what he's getting. And so um, he, said, he said it right here. Uh, and we indeed justly, verse 41. We're getting the just dessert of our reward of our actions. We indeed justly, this is right. We deserve being on this cross. But this man had done nothing amiss. I want you to think secondly about his prayer. Notice how he says this. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. There is at least a faith on his, in his heart to know that Jesus is who he says he is. Because he calls him Lord. Does he not? Mm -hmm. He said, Lord, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Somewhere that day on that cross, this man received salvation. And maybe he was saved at point after he got caught, whatever. Somewhere a conversion happened because he recognized he deserved what he's getting. Jesus didn't. He rebuked the other man. And so he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So there's... I think that this is all part of the salvation experience. Penitence goes along with um, repentance, similar words, repentance. It's an acknowledging that we're sinful. It's uh, wanting to turn away from that sin and asking God and admitting to God. When I got saved, I don't remember my exact words, but I prayed something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. 
I, I'm not going to argue with that. I didn't say that part. I'm just saying none of us can argue that point, can we? Mm -hmm. We're sinners. And you might say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. doesn't matter. If you're guilty of one point, you're guilty of all. We're sinners. The book of Romans pretty much puts all of us in the same boat except for Christ. He was the one that was, lived a sinless life. We're sinners. Some people just can't stand that. They can't stand to admit it. They don't want to hear about sin. There is a great hatred toward the word of God because it calls us who we are, rightfully calls us who we are. We're sinners. I heard about a church in our area, and I'm ashamed because there's some good people I know that go to that church, who are defying this idea of hating sin but loving the sinner. There's a group of people in that church. They're, you might call them woke, who hate that when a Christian says, I hate the sin, but I love the sinner. You can't, there's not, you, you're still hating. They were just so upset when somebody would say that. Folks, we need to hate sin Amen. like God does. Amen. And we still love the sinner. But the world today wants us to accept and affirm, oh, applaud. Anybody, any choice anybody makes, we've got to applaud it. It's good. Okay, that's fine. If you want to flip your gender, change your gender, and, and be this pervert or whatever, we've got to applaud it that some pedophile wants to read to kids in a, in a library. By the way, May 5th or May 2nd, I forget what it is. Vote yes if you live in Algola Township. You say, you're not supposed to say that for the pool, but I'm saying it. Amen. We need to undo ourselves from this Kent District Library, and we need to be able to uh, not promote these wicked people reading their trash to kids. Mm -hmm. How wicked, how evil. You say, well, it sounds like you hate the sinner too, Pastor. No, we don't. We hate the sin. It's evil. It's wicked. I was saying to Misty, I think it was Friday night, because they came in and Isaac had to go meet somebody. And I was sitting there holding Amos. And, and I was just looking at that precious face. And I looked at her and, and, and I'm a tear. It was clouding my eyes. I said, can you ever understand how people want to kill babies? Can you ever understand how people? It, there is a clouded mind sin. It is the blinding of the mind by the devil. It's demonic to want to kill these precious babies. I'm just pointing out how sin is deceitful and it's dreadful. And we need to call it what it is, folks. Mm -hmm. We're not ashamed to do that here at Camp Lake Baptist Church. We can still love the sinner. We can still want them to be saved and want them to change their lives. But see, they don't want to hear that. Because you're not affirming if you're trying to. In fact, we have laws in our, our state right now that make it illegal for you to try to convert someone who is a homosexual or probably transgender. They want to make that a crime that you would go to jail for. In essence, which is none of their business, what I say to somebody in counseling, either at this altar or in my office, in essence, they would like to know that so that they could charge me with that crime. It's an unconstitutional evil thing that's gotten put on our books. Mm -hmm. But this man, the cross of repentance, this is a man who had penitence. And so then he had a prayer. Notice the prayer, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Little did he know how fast that prayer would be answered. Look at the promise of Jesus. Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I was sharing the other night how that there's some people on YouTube and, and other blogs and things like that that are they're trying to say that Jesus, there's some preachers that are saying that Jesus literally went to hell in those three days and suffered in the fires of hell. The Bible doesn't teach that. He suffered on the cross. He paid for our sins on the cross. Read Isaiah 53. And with his stripes we are healed. He hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It was from that cross that he experienced what hell is like when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Read it in the Gospels. Read it in Psalm 22. It is so profound. It is so moving. No, Jesus did not go to hell. 
he did go and preach to the spirits in prison. And here's proof that he didn't go to hell right here. He said to that man, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What an awesome promise right here. Today thou shalt be with me. I just want to tell you something. This promise even applies to you today in this regard. If you died of a heart attack, if you died from a car accident, if you had a brain aneurysm and your brain stopped and you died, whatever, you choose it. If it happened to you today and you know the Lord is your Savior, I'll make that distinction. You must know the Lord is your Savior. Today, you're going to be with him in paradise. Amen. To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And then the bulk of the message is the, that middle cross. That middle cross, that cross that probably, I don't know if it stood higher we always kind of tend to think of these other two crosses and the, we don't know how it stood. We don't even know if they were shaped like we think in our mind. But Jesus hung on a cross. He was crucified on that cross. That middle cross, the cross, the first one was the cross of rejection. You heard that, right? The second one is the cross of repentance. Don't forget that. But this one, the cross of redemption. Praise God. On this cross was a man who died for sin. He died for sin. Isn't that awesome? He died for our sins. This is the lot, dividing line of all humanity, when you think about it. On the one side, let's say on the left, with the man who was the rejecter, lies all the humanity that rejects Jesus Christ. All who make up what the Bible describes in Revelation 20, where it says, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. It is about to have the great white throne judgment that's about to be talked about in Revelation 20. The sea gave up the dead which were in them. Every unsaved sailor on, uh, I think it's called the Indianapolis, that back there that delivered the bomb in 1945 and were torpedoed and went down. I don't know how many, 1,400, 1,600, floating around out there, waiting on those sharks to chomp on each other. Every one of them that was lost. How many people went down? Spanish galleons. The weight of that gold sunk them to the bottom, and they died in the sea. How many people have died in the sea? Thousands, probably millions. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So there is a resurrection. Daniel describes it this way. He says uh, that the resurrection, some to life and some to damnation. It's not the exact wording, but there is a resurrection. They don't happen at the same time. It's about seven years apart. The resurrection called the rapture. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive. But then later is this resurrection of the unsaved. That dividing line is that cross, that cross of the redemption. On the one side, you have all who've rejected. It's amazing. My uh, mom's uncle, Malcolm, he was one of the, I called them the mafia. Malcolm, Dewey, and uh, I'm trying to think of the other one, Clarence. They owned a steakhouse in Jacksonville. They were my grandfather's brothers. And Malcolm was a saved man. He tried to reassure my mom that granddaddy had gotten saved at the end. Well, I was there that night. It was my birthday. Turned into the 10th, the day after that he died during the middle of the night. I never saw him receive Christ. He might have had some experience with him that I didn't know about. And I hope he's right. I hope he got saved on his deathbed. But I was with him in that place that whole night. Weeping and crying, I saw a man who I saw reject Jesus all of my 17 years. A stogie right by his stump. He had cut his finger off when he was 17 in a sawmill. He always had that little short cigar. And he'd always say to my mom, I ain't no worse than that pastor down there. Daddy, you need to be saved. She would say many times, Daddy, I want you to get saved. I don't need it. Man, that echoes through my mind so many times. I hope he's not in that crowd. I hope he got saved. But if he didn't, he's in that whole group that's on the left side of Christ 
the dividing line of humanity, the cross of redemption, and those who reject. <clears throat> Never heard a more profound statement at a funeral than Dick Traxler. If you're not saved, why not? Nobody can come up with a good answer for that. If you're not saved, why not? Jesus did everything. He went to the death of the cross. He suffered untold horrors in his physical body. He shed his blood. He had a broken heart for us. When they rammed that spear up in his side after he died, out gushed blood and water. Psalm 22 says it this way. It talks about that his heart is melted like wax. Wow. The suffering of our Lord and the rejection of so many people. But praise God, there's another side. There is that side of repentance. There's another side. There are people who receive what Jesus has done for them, who realize that they're sinners, who repent of their sin and call upon the name of the Lord, and he will save, and he will say, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I don't want to get too technical. I might put you to sleep if you haven't already. But redemption is a wonderful theme. Redemption is a wonderful theme. I was looking it up in my Ryrie's um, basic theology. I like Charles Ryrie. I like the Ryrie Study Bible. I like his work, especially the one about uh, eschatology called the basic, um, Basics of the Premillennial pre -millennial Faith. Really good. I lost my book edition of that. I'm going to get another one someday. I love that man's ability to teach. I learned a lot from him in the early years of my ministry, Dr. Charles Ryrie. He says this, <clears throat> redemption means liberation because of a payment made. That's pretty good, isn't it? Liberation because of a payment made. And that payment was the death of the Lord himself. I think about Isaiah 53, 11. And it's talking about the Father. It says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. It was a sufficient payment. The father saw what the son was suffering and he was satisfied. That word goes along with propitiation and I won't get into all that, but Jesus satisfied the demand that would cover our sins. Redemption, the cross of redemption. It's interesting in the Old Testament, there are three words used for redemption. I want to try to pronounce them. Um, one looks like Q apostrophe L, so I will just call it quill, okay? Um, but that's the word that goes back with Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. You know that story, how that there was someone who uh, Boaz had to actually entreat first because they were next in line, and uh, they refused, and he was able to redeem Ruth and marry her. And now, what a wonderful story, the kinsman redeemer. And it's also a picture of Christ. Then you have another word, um, I don't know how to pronounce it either, PDH, uh, redeemed by grace and not by requirement. The idea that somebody might come along and redeem somebody um, out of just great sympathy, compassion. They don't deserve it. Uh, they didn't do anything to uh, get it. Boy, isn't that a picture of our salvation? And then the third word is like kofer, and it's the idea of the redemption of a slave. You know how a slave, if he was um, particularly liked his master, he could actually have his ear put against the post and an awl drawn through there, knocked through that hole. I don't know. I, I've never wanted to have pierced ears myself. But you see that they put a ring in there. I mean, he was, he was redeemed for life. And so that was an idea of Kofor, the, the redemption of a slave. Well, are we not slaves to sin? Are we not slaves to the devil in a certain sense if we're, un, if we're lost? We are, we are bound to the sinful world, but he wants to redeem us. So all three of these Old Testament ideas are, are great because they still point to the fact that Jesus is our redeemer. Redemption. I was thinking about this, and we'll, with this we'll close. Redemption can be summarized by three basic ideas. People are redeemed from something. Of course, the bondage of sin. The bondage of sin. Sin binds us. Sin controls us. Sin deceives us. But when you're redeemed from it, 
Secondly, people are redeemed by something. Mm. What are we redeemed by? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing flood? Are you washed in the what? Blood of the Lamb. You see, we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't ever be ashamed of the blood of Jesus. There are liberals and, and uh, I don't know, uh, panty waist wimps who say, oh, don't talk about blood. Uh, Jesus shed his blood. Now, I know I'm, I'm just about as bad as anybody as far as being weak in the knees. I'll never forget making Thomas stand up and his dog had ran into his knee and he was crying and laying on the couch. And Mary said, he broke his leg. I said, he didn't break your leg. Stand up. And his knee went backwards. And his dad went. <laughs> and his mom went. <laughs> Take him to the hospital. And I tell you, he had a cracked, whatever, tibia, fibia, whatever's under your knee. He did break his leg. It was, it was cracked. But his dad was so rough and tough. Yeah, I stand up. Quit being a baby. And then I almost passed out when I saw him. What if I had seen blood? One of our statements as a kid's going, I don't want to hear about it unless I see blood. Because <laughs> I didn't want to go to the hospital all the time, you know? But when I did see blood, especially human blood, uh, let me get a hold of something. I don't know how these people work in hospitals, sticking people with needles, drawing that blood, and you know. But have you ever come up on an accident and seen blood everywhere? Have you ever come up on that? My, I'll never forget my dad telling me, Noah, my real dad. He said, son, I saw something this week. And I was just a little boy. He said, I came up on a train wreck, hit a car, and I went over there and I asked the guy, can I see what happened? He said, sir, you don't want to see it. He said, and I looked around him anyway, and he said, I wish I hadn't seen it. He said, blood everywhere. That person was ripped apart by that train. He said, I wish I would have listened to him and not seen it. He said, that view has haunted me. He said, you don't want to see stuff like Hey, Dad, I won't. <laughs> These people with glee did what they did to Jesus. They took a reed and they drove that crown of thorns in his head. They plucked out his beard. Can you imagine what that would have like? The Bible says in Isaiah 52 that his visage was marred above any man. You've seen some of these boxers. They're all puffed up. Their eyes are almost closed. No man has ever experienced in the ring what Jesus experienced the day he was crucified. Because there was so much demonic vehemence and hatred. And Satan was behind a lot of these punches. And they were hurting him in every way they could. His visage was marked above any man. It was to pay a price. Our redemption. So he paid that price. With his blood. And finally, people are redeemed to something. And this is what we'll close with. We're redeemed to serve the one who brought us with his blood. I want to read something out of 1 Corinthians. And just to make this point, and then we'll close. 1 Corinthians 6. Sorry, I should have had it marked, but I didn't. 1 Corinthians 6. It says in verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Well, I'm an American. I'm free. I'm, I can life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. I, I'm a free man. I don't have to, I don't belong to anyone. Yes, you do, Christian. He says, which ye uh, have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He's redeemed us to serve him. He's redeemed us to live for him. Christian, we have an obligation. And by the way, a lot of, I, don't, I don't know of any buyer's remorse. You didn't really buy it. You received it by faith. I don't know of any buyer's remorse. Just use that phrase. I don't know of any Christian said, 
Man, I blew it when I got saved. I don't know anybody that says that. When people truly get saved, they're excited about it. They're, they're happy to know they're not going to go to hell. They're going to go to heaven when they die. But this might be a source of that buyer's remorse if you are not told, hey, when you get saved, Jesus now owns you. You're bought with a price. You're his. You are God's. Therefore, you have an obligation to glorify him with your body and your spirit, which are God's. Father, thank you for these three crosses that remind us what this, this whole week is about. As we approach next Sunday in the resurrection, we know you had to die first. Thank you for being willing to die. And I pray, Lord, that something said today would speak to every heart. <clears throat> Have your will. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Let's all stand. Let's turn to 131. It's in Jesus' name.